Hi, and welcome to Debugging OBS using Static Trace Points. My name is Ilko Shodron, and I'll guide you through this presentation. So what is a user statically defined trace point, or USDT for short? Well, it's a specific event that has been identified to be useful by the developer during the development phase, or maybe later when debugging. It's defined by a name, so it's easy for scripts to use them. In other words, no need for a script to figure out where in the source code we would like to add a trace event and map this to the actual assembler code. The compiler optimizes out variables whenever possible. So even if you can identify a trace point, the variable you are interested in might not be available. This is the same as with GDB when you hit a breakpoint and you can't get the variable you're looking for. A USDT will prevent the variable from being optimized out. A side effect could be that it might add some runtime overhead. What are the benefits of these USDT probes? If carefully chosen, it will allow development of external tools for troubleshooting, which are easy to maintain from OVS release to release. So how do USDT probes work? First, you need to define the trace point in the source code, for example, with the dtrace probe macro. The first parameter is the provider, which identifies the application or subsystem. The second parameter is the name, which identifies the probe point. Note that these are not string literals. In the example above, you see a probe2 type macro, which indicates there are two additional variables being passed on to this probe. These are the ones that are not optimized out by the compiler. So what does the macro do? First, it will make sure all the variables are available. Here you see that the tv underscore sec value is moved to the AX register. This value would normally not be available and optimized out by the compiler. The value of x is already available on the stack pointer, but for simplicity, this has been removed from the screen dump. Secondly, a no operation or no op assembler instruction is inserted, which can be replaced for something else when the trace point gets activated. And finally, details about the trace point are added to the dot node dot step sdt l file section. This information contains the location of the trace point, the no op instruction, and the registers holding the variables. You can extract this information using the tplist tool from the BPF compiler collection toolset or the readl tool. See the slide for some example outputs. With this information available in the object file, there are multiple ways you can use it. One of them is to have the application itself manage the enablement of these trace events and store the content in a circular buffer. One library, including backend tools that exist, is the Linux Tracing Toolkit Next Generation Framework, or LTTNG in short. This approach keeps all trace handling in user space, so no kernel overhead is introduced, which makes it faster than a Linux site implementation. The Linux site implementation uses the existing uprobe framework and can even combine it with eBPF. In the later case, an eBPF program can be executed, which determines what needs to be done with the trace event. Without eBPF, all events get stored in a ring buffer, which can be read by a user space program. This slide shows the GDB disassemble output of the previous program with the uprobe attached to the trace point. As you can see, the no op has been replaced with an in3 instruction, which will trap the CPU and the kernel handler will take over. Various uprobe related backends exist. Ftrace, which is not actually a backend, but a Linux debug file system, which allow you to configure and monitor uprobes. Trace command, which is a user front end to the ftrace debug file system. Perf, system tap, and dtrace are all using the uprobe framework. BPF trace is a high level tracing language, which also includes uprobes with eBPF. BCC is a set of tools which allow you to easily write scripts to interact with the various Linux kernel debug frameworks, just like BPF trace, including uprobes with eBPF. Later on, we have a quick demo on the last two tool suites in combination with OpenVSwitch. So what is the performance impact of adding these trace points? To figure this out, I've added some of them in the hot path of OBS DPDK. Not the place where you would put them in real life, but it's a good way to measure their impact. This event will happen every time a batch of packets is enqueued to the vhost driver. I did this with both the dtrace macros and the LTTNG framework ones. See the diff on the slide. For doing these tests, I will use the OVS perf PVP test framework, running both the wire speed and zero loss tests. 
Both tests will use 64 byte packets with 100 IPv4 streams. My system has an Intel Xenon CPU with an Excel 710 running at 40 gig connected to a Xena tester. The OBS configuration used is shown on the slide. This slide shows the results for the wire speed test. You can see that the presence of the trace points in the code do not introduce any noticeable overhead. They are well within the deviation of the individual runs. However, when enabling them, you can see the impact. For dtrace, which uses BPF trace to print the events, the impact is almost 12%. For LTTNG, it's only around 3% due to the missing kernel overhead, as all the events are processed in user space. These are the results for the zero loss test, which shows similar results as the full speed one. The slowdown due to the existence of the trace points might actually be a lot lower. This is related to the relatively high zero loss step interval. So what do I suggest to incorporate into OBS? The LTTNG implementation, although having less overhead when enabled, has some unwanted side effects. For example, if you include the library, you have no control over it. It's all enabled by default and does all its thread magic under the hood. For the experiments, I had to make sure vSwitchD was not detaching itself or else it would not work at all. Additionally, we could also write our own tracing library, but I guess this would be an overkill with all the nice tools already available. So my proposal is to use the dtrace probe like macros, with the wrapper that automatically detects the number of arguments. Here you see an example where we include two probes into the main vSwitchD loop. One probe right in the beginning of the loop and one probe at the end, right before the pull block. With these two probes we can measure things like the number of bridge runs per second, the time each bridge run will take, and the delay between the bridge runs. Here you see a BPF trace snippet that will show you two histograms based on the previous trace points. One will show you the time it takes for each bridge run, while the other tells you how long you have to wait in the pull block. Now let's watch the script in action. So first let me show you the script. Uh, it should be similar to the previous slide. Uh, then we run the script with the uh, hit of the OBS vSwitch daemon. And you can see the individual events coming in. And then when we stop it, it will show you the uh, histograms. We are roughly 35 uh, events for our bridge runs. You can see that the average bridge run time is uh, roughly the same. Um, and then you can see there is difference in the, uh, the time it takes for each uh, pull block to wait, which is nicely displayed in the histogram. One thing that keeps coming back when debugging OBS is are any packets hitting the slow path, and if so, which ones and why? Currently, some log messages exist, but in general, they do not get what you need. Sometimes dynamic trace points might help, or even GDP, but this might be cumbersome in a customer environment. Life would be so much easier if we could have a USDT probe. So I'm suggesting to adding one with the following data to be captured. The data path name, the upcall type, the packet content and the size of the packet, key and key length, which is basically the netlink metadata sent together with the packet. On top of this probe, I have created a script that will dump all this information and even allow the packets to be saved in a pcat file for offline analysis. The next slide will show you a demo. So now let's take a look at the script. Uh, this time it is a Python-based script using the BCC toolchain. Um, this toolchain will actually compile eBPF programs and then um, you can interact with those and get statistics out of it. Um, if we would run it without any options, you will see you first get some warnings. This is the eBPF program being compiled. Um, it depends on your uh, platform if you do or do not get these warnings, but you could ignore them safely. Um, and then once it's up and running, you can get some of the basic information, um, like the time the event has happened, the CPU it came on, the handler thread, uh, the process ID of that specific thread, and then the data path interface name, um, as you see here, and then the type of upcall uh, that you received. 
where in this example, the zero means a general miss up call, which means there was no flow match found, and a one is an action up call, and this is basically um, an up call where the action needs to be processed by user space and not uh, in the kernel. Um, in this scenario, it are packets that need to be sent to the controller. Uh, then you get the packet length of the packet um, and the flow key length, uh, which is basically the, uh, the metadata that is also received with the packet um, when it's sent up, up call, when you get the up call. Um, and this is um, the kernel net link messages. So next, what we could do is we could see what other options are available uh, because we would like to show a little bit more information about the packet content. So if you can see here, you, we can dump the packet content and we can decode it, which basically means that the output will be handled by Scapy and we get a user interpretable string rather than a hex value. Uh, the same thing goes for the flow key. The flow key contains the uh, metadata and um, we would probably would like to do it as a raw dump. So you will get uh, the individual elements of the netlink message. And then finally, um, by default, we only capture 64 bytes of the packet um, from the kernel space to user space. Um, and then to get everything, we could increase that by using the minus S option. Um, and then in the example above, we see packets around 128, 200 bytes. So let's say 256 should be safe here. Um, and you could also do that for the key, uh, but I think the 64 bytes is uh, enough for us. Um, and if you would like to write the data, we can save it to a PCAP file and we call it uh, trace um, uh, USDT dot pcap um, and it will be sent to that file as well we can inspect it later all right so let's run it for a little bit and then stop it and then we'll figure out where we would see a nice up call that we can uh, can look at so there's a couple of them coming in we see all kinds of different ones uh, being received um, so let's take this example here where we see that the uh, the packet comes in uh, on the System one, it is a up call type zero, 126 byte of the packet. Um, here we see the net link uh, messages being decoded one by one. Um, and then below, we would also see the scapy dump of the packet. In this case, it's an ICMP packet. And then of course, we also have everything in a trace. So we can do uh, T-shark and should be able to dump it. Um, and see the actual packet contact. All right, I hope you liked the demo. Uh, let's move on to the next. Even more complex scripts can be created. For example, using the BCC suite to combine different type of trace points. With this, I've created the upcall cost script, which uses OVS USDT probes, kernel trace points available in the OVS kernel module, and K probes attached to a OVS kernel module function. The idea behind the script was to measure the cost of the kernel upcalls. In other words, how much extra time do we spend by asking user space to do the flow lookup? I will now show a quick demo of the script and the various statistics it gathers. I won't dump the script content as it's around 1600 lines, but I'll show you the help instead. There are quite some options, but you should start with using the defaults. One thing I would suggest you to do is to write the events to a file so you can replay, reanalyze it later. This is useful if you want to modify the script to get additional statistics. The quiet option might also help if you receive a lot of events. In this example, I'll read in a previously saved trace set. First, you'll see all the events being dumped out on the screen with some of their arguments. You can use the quiet option to prevent this. When it's done reading the events, 10,000 in this example, it will dump which events are received. In our case, 2,000 each, as we're doing a PVP test with 2,000 flows. Important here is to notice the missed events section. If missed event exists, you need to increase the trace buffer size. Now it will analyze the individual events and correlate them together based on the various metadata 
like packet content, thread info, etc. Next, it will show you the number of upcalls per handler thread. This might be useful to see how well they are balanced. Here you see they are unbalanced and it might be worth investigating why. Next up are batch sizes. vSwitchD tries to read up to 64 packets at a time from the kernel space before processing them. This could potentially influence the time it takes to process a single packet as sending a packet out is delayed until all the packets have gone through the lookup stage. Next is a histogram showing how long it takes for vSwitchD to receive the upcall packet from the kernel after the kernel module has queued it up. The next histogram shows the reverse. In other words, the time it takes for the kernel module to receive the packet execute command after OVS has sent it. This histogram shows how much time is spent not doing the flow lookup. So in other words, the overhead of sending the packet to the kernel, program the kernel and ask the kernel to forward the packet again based on the newly programmed flow. Finally, a histogram showing the total time it takes from the up call till the packet is sent back to the kernel for forwarding. Here you see some entries with a 9 millisecond delay. Looking a bit closer at the data, this was due to the fact we had the misbalance in the distribution plus a lot of 64 packet patches. The later is causing the lookup time of the other 63 packets to be included. Also note that all these events were received in just over 155 milliseconds. So, if you would like to receive more accurate upcall statistics, try to minimize the batch sizes or use a more realistic environment and not start the traffic in a huge burst. This is the end of the presentation and if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. The patch head including the scripts will be sent out shortly. Thanks for watching. Bye bye. Hello uh, and uh, welcome back uh, to the uh, to the live presentation. Uh, do we have our, uh, our our presenter? Would you like to uh, join me on uh, video? Uh, welcome. So uh, thank you for the uh, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Um, my first question is: Can you tell everyone the the right way to say your name? I uh, I know I've met you before, but I can't remember it. Yeah, it's Ilko Sheldon. Uh, thank you. So uh, we have plenty of time for questions, uh, and uh, I, I have some of my own to add to the ones in the Q and A. Um, so uh, the, the the one that I uh, that I want to ask first, and I don't think it uh, is in the Q and A, is uh, have have you managed to use this to uh, to debug uh, uh, real problems that you've uh, that, that you've encountered, uh, um, and uh, what what was the you know what was the most valuable feature, or how did you find yourself using it? Yeah, I, th I think the, this all came from uh, debugging some customer problems in the field. Uh, and I think the one, uh, the upcall monitor that we have is the, the main thing uh, that drove this. Because um, we get upcalls in the field where people say some packets are slow or some packets are not forward at all. And it's hard to figure out you know, where do you lose the packet? Is it due to that specific upcall or are we facing that problem you know, due to maybe a kernel delay, for example? Um, so this tool would really give us the insight of, okay, which package do we get in user space and, and why? Um, and also with the metadata, it gives us, you know, which input port, stuff like that. So uh, one of the things that this really uh, drove home for me was uh, one of the cases where uh, you, you, uh, you, you displayed a table and it showed packet lengths and it showed the length of the flow key. And uh, one of the things that stands out is the flow keys are often longer than the packets. Um, so that, that just shows that, uh, that that sort of interface uh, between the data path and uh, the, uh, the the OVS slow path or control plane is actually pretty inefficient. Um, and uh, sort of one of my long-term goals for OVS has been um, let's let's try to find a uh, a more efficient uh, interface there. And we uh, we haven't got there yet, but this this really uh, sort of uh, drives home uh, the uh, that that necessity. So uh, let's uh, let, let's jump in uh, to the, uh, the the actual uh, attendee questions. Uh, the first one uh, I've got here uh, is uh, from uh, Flavio. Uh, so Flavio says, uh, as uh, Flavio Fernandez, let me uh, get this one right this time. Uh, as OVS moves deeper into the NICs, uh, for example, smart NICs, do you know if vendors will make tracing like this still doable? 
So if you were talking about, you know, a general smart NIC on a OVS system that is integrated, I think the packet, the first packet, even in those scenarios, still go to the CPU. Um, so that from that part, I think it's uh, not a problem at all because um, we still get that first packet. Um, I'm not sure on how it's going to be working if vendors that actually include OVS as part of their NIC, then you know you need to have console access and be able to use that platform uh, on top of that. Um, and then talking about you know hardware vendors having trace capabilities where they can capture packets, I'm not aware of such tools. I guess internally they might have it, but um, I haven't seen any. That makes sense. So uh, our second question here is from uh, Marcella Leitner, who says, uh, does, does Wireshark uh, know about uh, OVS's uh, Netlink message formats? Uh, if uh, if it did, then we could use it uh, to, uh, to to sniff with NLMON, and then we could see you know up calls and data path changes in Wireshark uh, in, instead of in the, the sort of a, a text mode tool. Yes, yeah, so I'm not sure if it did, if it if it uh, figures out the specific Netlink messages yet uh, in Wireshark. I don't know, uh, but you do not get the actual packet content uh, within that uh, Netlink message. So I think that's the part that you probably will be missing. Yeah, uh, so uh, it, it's actually uh, possible to uh, uh, submit special things uh, like this to the Wireshark uh, maintainers as well. Uh, I think that, for example, it, it can dissect uh, OpenFlow messages. So uh, if people do want that, then it, it's probably possible to add that. Uh, let's see. Oh, and then we have one more question here from uh, from William Tu. Uh, who says that uh, this uh, reminds him uh, of the OVS app Kittle coverage slash show tool. Is USDT uh, capable of doing what coverage show does now? So, uh, but before you jump into that, let me uh, explain uh, for uh, attendees who might not know what coverage slash show does. So uh, OVS and OVN uh, maintain what it calls, what they call coverage counters, uh, which uh, keep track of events that happen. Uh, things like, for example, a packet being received, uh, and also keep track of when they happen. So if you use coverage show, it'll tell you a list of uh, the number of events that have happened in the last uh, um, ever, and then in the last few seconds, and, and then so on. Yeah, so, so in theory, you could do that, but you need to put a trace point, aesthetically defined trace point for every event you like to trace in that example. Um, but yeah, if you have those points, uh, Identified in your code, you can you can easily use this, this the existing scripts like the script I show you for the um, for the bridge run. You can easily extract data like how many runs you have in the last 10 seconds, 20 seconds, as long as the tool was running in the background. So, yeah, I think definitely stuff like that can be captured. Great. Uh, so uh, what's uh, what's the next step uh, for your tool? Uh, what what do you uh, what do you hope to continue adding to it? Yeah, so, so my goal is actually to first send out the patch uh, set as is with the three tools that I have uh, have shown here. Um, and I think after that, uh, the idea is that people that run into problems, because I think that is the best uh, the best way forward. So is as you run into problems, you start creating those scripts based on the trace points. Um, and then hopefully others can contribute with their you know, problems that they run into and add more scripts to it um, as part of the OVS repository so that you can easily add your own scripts or reuse, you know, stuff that other people already done. That's great. So uh, the uh, do, do you, it sounds like the patches haven't gone out yet. Do you expect that to be soon? Yeah, I'm, I'm cleaning up the last uh, the last script in the patch. I've actually uh, gathered some data from a OVN type environment um, to get some of the recent up calls. And uh, there are some small problems with the, the last script that need to be fixing. And then hopefully by the end of the uh, this or next week, my plan is to send them upstream. So. Well, that sounds uh, really great. Uh, let's uh, let's thank our speaker one more time uh, through uh, uh, virtual applause, uh, and uh, uh, then it's uh, time to move on uh, to our next talk. Uh, uh, 